Welcome to Real Reboot. I'm your host, Sage Goodwin, and today I'm joined by Sarah Hinkley. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Sage. How are you? Doing fantastic. So, just to kick it off, who is Sarah? Sarah is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Barn Owl Precision Agriculture, and I was born here in Colorado Springs, lived uh, there for a little bit, and then spent a lot of time in Texas after my parents got divorced and then moved back home to be closer to family um, in 2016, and then been here ever since, and happy to be back. Excellent. So let's kick this off and and talk a bit about your business. Could you go into some details of of what it is and then we can go dive a little bit deeper? Yeah. Um, So Barn Owl, we just call it Barn Owl for short. And we are an information company at our foundation. We focus on AI driven analysis and then robotics operational support. And that is for farmers to try to improve profits for them and create better uh, operations, basically improve, um, you know, sustainable farming, regenerative practices, just yields, and then reduce the use of uh, chemicals and and try to help our farmers get a little bit more sleep and spend more time with their families. We've been doing this um, since 2018, and we started out just by doing drone analysis for farmers out on the eastern side of Colorado, out of La Junta. And since then, we've grown and we've been talking to farmers ever since, just trying to figure out what really matters to them, how we can really make a difference, um, and figure out the practices and the technology that will actually improve their operations rather than just add more stuff to them and Mm -hmm. make it more difficult for them to, to focus on one thing at a time, basically. Excellent. So what was the process like uh, uh, going and approaching these these ag businesses, these farmers? Because historically, at least probably in the last few decades, technology has been one of those things that hasn't really been touched upon in this space, but is now being worked on in greater numbers. What was that process like? Was there like a convincing period where you're like, oh, hey, guys, <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's not not going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Pretty much that. Um, so our grandparents luckily are from La Junta, the La Junta area, and they lived most of their lives there. So having those okay. connections, having that family connection is really important for when you're bringing things like robots that we're sitting here saying are going to take care of your weeds and cut your labor. Uh, they, they think you're full of crap when you, when you roll up and you tell them that. Um, and so having that connection, having the farmers who are your neighbors and who have, you know, who have been, you've been on their farm picking tomatoes since you were six, Mm -hmm. um, they are a little bit more open to letting you test and then going to the other farms. Um, it is, we will we'll do it for you for a couple of times for free, just to show mm-hmm. you that we're not full of it yeah. um, and prove that what we're doing is really going to make a difference for you. And so we started in La Junta and we started working with just some of our local farmers. And then we started working with the research, um, the, like the CSU extensions in that area as well. And so just by making those connections and and trying to develop systems and technology that actually makes sense, um, we do that directly with our farmers. So if we have an idea, we bring it to a farmer and we say, hey, what do you think of this? And if they Mm -hmm. say you're, you're not, that's not going to work. It doesn't make (laughs) sense for us. Then, then we consider something different. Um, And so we try to bring in the, the technology side of it from our end and then the actual ag operations side of it from there end and that's the way that we've been able to be successful and you know differentiate ourselves because we don't have the PhDs and the the decades of experience in the technology side of it that other companies do but we we have the farmer experience we can mm-hmm. talk to them and understand what is going to make a difference in ag and that's what's really important what what started you down this path where was it that you're like oh hey this is a, an area that really needs um, a solution. W- what started down that path? Yeah, so um, again, back to a little bit of the family thing. We have uh, farmers, not in Colorado, but in kind of the eastern part of the United States. We grow corn and strawberries and tomatoes and a number of other specialty crops. And so being, you know, growing up on in the summer, spending time in Arkansas, mm-hmm. growing up on the farm in that sense, um, really kind of created a passion for food and understanding how hard it is, how mm-hmm. hard 
hard farming actually is and then how vital it is to be able to feed you know my grandparents who fed me and then I just had a baby so being able to feed her um, that's that concept is just the I guess the driver behind it I mean we really do need these these farmers to survive Mm -hmm. and then um, the technology side of it is just being able to you know help improve everything that's going on Jaron one of uh, my brother and then a co-founder of the company he actually had a drone experience doing volumetric measurement for okay. companies and he traveled throughout the United States and was, you know, going through uh, mining and rock quarries and, and doing that. And then when we moved back to Lahana to be closer to our family, there wasn't a whole lot of mines or um, work available in that sense. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of how the, the barn owl seed got planted was by having that technology absence I guess mm-hmm. um, and then having the passion for the food side of things um, Brian and I Brian uh, my husband and a, another co-founder we worked in restaurants a lot so we like to say that we went from uh, table to farm instead of farm to table <laughs> and we just decided that we can make a much bigger difference in the whole system mm-hmm. doing you know starting a business and and being able to help from the growing side from the producer side of things because mm-hmm. from this side we can make a difference in the supply chain and climate and sustainable operations um, and future generations ability to feed themselves and create and for farmers to create a living wage because the work that the farmers are doing is just so incredibly hard and the the money that they make doing it it's not enough to sustain and so we're losing farmers every day Mm. and then the labor side of things we don't have enough people available to you know weed to to harvest, to create a sustainable supply chain. So all of that combined is, is how, you know, is why we are doing what we're doing and how important it is. Exactly. It, it's when, when we take people on, on a tour at Emerge, cause you are based here in Emerge. Um, if, if I'm leading the tour, I'm like, okay, this is probably the coolest business that we have in the building. And that's saying something because we have some pretty cool yeah. businesses. But you're, you're pairing agriculture, technology, uh, AI, robots, drones, like basically every child's dream of the future you're putting in together in your business, yep. um, and which is incredible. Could you talk a little bit about the, um, the amount of impact that this has on farmers, uh, especially I know in, in this area, we are in quite a bit of a food desert in terms of what we produce here and what stays here locally. Yeah. So, so as far as things staying locally, that's, uh, that's a challenge that we will tackle probably in a few years, but, mm-hmm. um, our ability to allow farmers to grow, you know, an acre or two acres of tomatoes. And then in between those rows of tomatoes, we can plant things like corn or beans or other things to really make sure that we're being good stewards of the land Mm -hmm. and growing multiple types of crops so that we aren't uh, destroying our soil and, and destroying our ecosystem because, you know, for example, bees need multiple types of crops in order to pollinate. They can't just survive off of potatoes. Mm. And so if we're able to, you know, polycrop and create a different type of, or not a different type of ecosystem, but create the ecosystem that is beneficial for our area, then we'll have a benefit on things like climate change because we'll, mm-hmm. you know, we'll be able to, uh, you know, reduce carbon impact hopefully is the idea behind it so our systems our robot for example it's small and it's designed to go in between 30 inch rows or or smaller and we will be this year we're just weeding with it but we'll eventually be able to plant and harvest as well and so a farmer can come up to barn owl and say hey i want to plant these five different chop types of crops but i only have 160 acres we can plant all five different top types of crops in 160 acres and allow that farmer to increase their profit margin by having a a specialty crop reducing their labor and being able to reduce their inputs their chemical inputs because they can basically go organic at that point Mm. Um, and then that we can keep it in our local communities just by having more people go out to the farms and talk to our farmers and say, hey, I want to buy your tomatoes and get it locally from there. That's how we're starting today. In the long term, we're going to you know, create a, an impact on the supply chain 
just we're probably going to try to just revamp the whole thing but um that's going to be a couple years down the road Mm -hmm. so so you're talking about these individual pieces of the business how do they all work together you've got the drones you've got the ai you've got the analysis you've got the data collection how does that all work together for the benefit of a farmer yeah so it it starts with the people actually because we are a service-based company um we sell very few products you know directly to farmers the idea behind that is farmers don't have enough time to be able to you know buy a drone Mm -hmm. um, figure it out themselves fly it process the data analyze it and then make a decision they need that done for them in in seconds basically Mm -hmm. and so that's where we come in as a service and our people behind behind the scenes um, really understanding what the technology the combination of it um, for the farmers that's how we make a difference the drones we use as a tool to collect information and so basically what we do from from visiting you know Hannigan to harvest for him we would go and fly our drones to collect a, a field map analyze that and figure out where opportunity is where you know could we improve your irrigation because you're leaking over here hmm. or do you have a um, uh, slope on your land that's causing your your fertilizer to run off and and grow more or, or drown in that area, um, and then we use those that same information to program our robots to drive through the field. And so we're we're using AI to make it quickly to make it happen quickly, and then for our robots we're using GPS to be able to keep the cost low. So we for our robots we don't use so much C and decide for safety we do. Um, But when we go into the fields, we program the GPS location of every plant, basically. And then we and then we decide where we want the the robots to weed and where we want them to stay away from. And there's a safety radius on that. And um, they they go and they do it again and again. And it's a it's a maintenance system so that, again, we can keep the the profit margin higher by reducing chemical inputs Mm -hmm. if a farmer wants us to spray we can do that but we try to avoid it Um, and so the combination using the drone as a tool and then using the information as really the the game changer for the farmers um, and then you know just the physical action of being able to cut labor that's kind of the the ecosystem of barn owl i guess and, Mm -hmm. and how we really make a difference what was the what was the prototype phase like? How did you get to where you are now? Yeah, <laughs> so lots of building. We actually do most of our manufacturing and development. We do all of our manufacturing and development ourselves right now. Um, we have a partner, Klein Makerspace, out of La Junta, and so they have um, they have created a system for you know to help us they have 30 3d printers and some laser machines and cnc machines and then barn owl also has quite a few you know 10 or so 3d printers um and so that combination of the the equipment allows us to develop the products that we want and test them and we can keep the cost low we don't have to spend a hundred thousand dollars per unit to figure out if it's going to work we can spend you know $100 $100 per unit to see if yeah. it's going to work. And then the other thing behind that is farmers are going to need something different in two years or three years. And so we can keep the cost low for them by by making it ourselves. And so that partner in Makerspace has been really vital in our development. Um, we've done a lot of learning ourselves. We've done a lot of failing ourselves just in mm-hmm. will this work, will it not work? Um, and then, you know, we're gracious to our farmers for allowing us to go out and test and, and forgive us when something bad happens like a wheel falls off in the the middle of the field or something you know um but you're never going to get it right if you don't test it if you don't try it you'll never you'll never figure it out if you don't if you don't at least try to break the boundaries of of the fine line of what will work and what the cost is going to be and and um all the other factors that go into really creating a a impactful product and service. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about your business too, is it has this, there, there's a heart to it that we are, we're not just doing this because we see a a gap. I mean, there is a gap, but we're also seeing this from the farmer's perspective because this industry has been taken advantage of so many times throughout history and to go in there and to have this perspective that is very different because you come from, you understand the rural aspect of it. Uh, Could you go a little bit about the the rural idea like why why rural um for me personally and and jaron and brian as well um you know it's it's our heart basically it's the heartbeat of us it's the heartbeat of america um it's where 
ideas flourish. It's where we have the freedom to grow, uh, um, and you know, in in a personal sense, and be able to you know have a few acres and and mm-hmm. be able to kind of buy a house that's a reasonable price and grow our families. Um, the people in rural America are innovative and creative and work from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day Mm -hmm. um and and they really are trying to make a difference um and you know for for us we came from colorado springs recently um and we recently we moved to florence and we had a baby and so now we're trying to to figure out how we can stay in florence um Mm -hmm. for the rural side of it and then um you know it's the perfect location because we love the mountains and we have mountains all around us. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as rural, it's just, it's because it's the heartbeat of us and of America, we think. Mm-hmm. So why, why did you choose Florence? So that had a lot to do with Brad. Um, mostly we, we got connected through the whole network, I guess, through Greater Colorado Venture Fund, who is an investor in our company. Um, but they introduced us to Mark Maddock and Brad Rowland, and we participated in an accelerator program um, in March of this year, I, th- I think. <laughs> it was yeah. March of this year. Yeah, it feels so long <laughs> yes, ago. Yes, <laughs> it does. Um, and so, you know, we spent a, a few classes up here in Florence, and we went out to dinner one time while we were here. Um, when we toured Emergent Campus, we hung out, you know, downtown, I guess, on Main Street, Mm -hmm. um, and just fell in love with everything that Florence has to offer. There's parks, um, there's nice schools, there's the Main Street that has all the little shops and the restaurants, and then the thriving companies here at Emergent Campus, you know, us being able to go over to to Chris at Second 61 and and bounce ideas off of or have Brad um, say, hey, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. That kind of environment doesn't exist for the price that we can manage as a startup in something like Denver or Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. We just can't afford to do something like that. We were in Colorado Springs, we were working out of our house and that was a 900 square foot house. So having (laughs) printers and robots and development and then two Huskies, um, that just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. You can't build a a thriving company in that kind of environment. And so we're gracious to, to emergent campus to give us this opportunity. Um, but the, the, just the environment here, the, the vibe that we get mm-hmm. um, to build successful startups, it's its awesome. And I think that this type of emergent camp- campus concept can be replicated throughout other rural towns and, and inspire that creativity and innovation that I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. What, what is the process like uh, to go into Colorado and help these farmers? What's, what's the main pr- uh, crop that Colorado produces? Is there one or is it a variety that, that Colorado produces? So Colorado is pretty heavy on corn for feed and cattle. Um, and then after that, we, we grow the best potatoes in, in the entire country, I think, out of the San Luis Valley. Um, you'll find the best melons in the entire country out of Rocky Ford. We have phenomenal peppers out of Pueblo and chilies out of Pueblo. Um, and then up north we have wonderful beans and anywhere you go in this, in this state, you'll be able to find a unique agricultural environment, I think, because while we grow a lot of corn and alfalfa for our cattle, um, in between, in that mix, there's, you know, the melons and the potatoes Mm -hmm. and the peppers that you're not going to find anywhere else because our environment, our climate is so different. We have wonderful sunshine in the summer. Um, we have great soil. We have a water problem right now, but we're figuring that out. But when we do have water, um, it's you know Rocky Mountain spring water or Rocky Mountain fresh water, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those those ecosystems um, are just perfect for growing specialty crops and and I guess corn and alfalfa for our our cattle. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> a little bit about the ag okay. side of it. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> Where do you, because I'm so Brad, uh, manager of Emerging Campus, uh, he has this saying that every business is a tech business. And going forward, we're seeing a lot more of that collaboration with technology and agriculture. Where do you see that going in the future? And why is it so important that we get there? Ag is going to be, I think, the most impressive kind of technological change in any industry because we have so much opportunity and we need 
we need so much creativity in this industry. It's just going to open the door for small companies like us and um, and be able to create, you know, just life-changing things for this industry. Um, we see ag going to a very heavy kind of robotics and information type thing where we are able to, I guess, watch and see what's going on on a specific farm or in a specific region to the to the minute almost mm. with our satellites, with our drone technologies, um, with our AI and our ability to have... Um, you know, cell cell phone connectivity, 5G and 4G in rural areas, we can yeah. we can get updates immediately. Um, the benefit that's going to have is it's going to allow our farmers to continue to grow food in a natural sense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, greenhouses are great, but but with our population rising and with with us using so much land to house that population, um, we're going to continue to need to grow food outside just because it has to be done quickly. It has to be done on a larger scale and we have to be good stewards to the soil. We have to be good stewards to our, our environment. So we could even do things where we have a forest and grow food in, in between the trees in that forest Mm -hmm. with products like ours and have our robots go in and plant and harvest and Mm -hmm. take care of the, the growth cycle of those crops in between the forests. So we don't have to cut trees down to grow food. Um, just the, 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 there are no limits in Mm -hmm. this industry and with creativity, um, and innovation and the, you know, for us, things like improved battery technology, we can, we Mm -hmm. can go anywhere. Eventually barn owl will go to Mars and, and go grow food on Mars. Um, so (laughs) when, (laughs) when we say the sky is the limit the I mean, it really is, there Uh is no limit here because we're going to need to grow food. Maybe Mars is the limit. Yeah, Maybe Mars is the limit there. (laughs) (laughs) I will not be traveling to that. Jaren is, is the, (laughs) the space guy for us. (laughs) That, that's so fascinating. I, I, there's there's so many awesome things with the business, but I, w- I want to talk about soil because that's something that I, I think is so fascinating and a lot of people don't understand is that you can have, um, depending on what crop that you, you plant, it is it could be a benefit or a detriment to, to the areas. Uh, what, what are some of the things that Barnell does in terms of soil? Um, f- you know, so we're not agronomists. We are going to eventually partner with... Um, with more skilled people to help us and help our farmers on that sense. Um, where we come in as far as the soil regeneration is, is our ability to allow our farmers to put multiple crops into the mm-hmm. same acre, basically. Now, how does um, that work? It's, it doesn't work yet, but it will <laughs> in the future. We, when we are able to plant and harvest um, for our farmers. So we'll, we'll send our robots into a 30-inch section of the field and okay. plant something like tomatoes. And then that next row over, we'll plant something like beans, which are nitrogen rich and and Mm -hmm. put a lot of really great stuff into the soil. And so having tomatoes, beans, you know, broccoli, um, all in the same field is going to create a soil environment that is is going to make a difference. Now the you know the actually doing the testing and and that comes from from field work and and we do some of that too we're getting away from it a little bit um but we'll partner with companies that do the kind of the testing to understand the the makeup that is most beneficial Mm -hmm. because it's going to be different for the soil that we have here in colorado versus arizona versus california um and so having our ability to figure out that information on a field by field basis is where we come in because because we are at our foundation and information company Mm -hmm. we will collect that information on a field by field basis and populate it by region or populate it by state and then understand what crops are doing better at what time of year Mm. um, based on if it's an el nino year you know so through through the hundred years of history that we have and the hundred years that we're going to be collecting that data that we can analyze is is how we make a difference in the soil. So mm-hmm. it all all comes back to the the data and the that technology. Is, that is fascinating. <laughs> You're basically digitizing like a tree structure in oh, terms yeah. of the rings. Uh, that that is amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and and the you know the best part about it is that we are doing it. 
you know, for, I guess, the greater good. It's going to be hopefully lucrative for us because we've given up everything <laughs> for this company <laughs> so far. Um, but in order to in order to have my daughter be able to feed her her potential children or her cousins mm-hmm. or whoever else, um, this has to be done. It has to be done today because we're seeing we're seeing how how negative some of the things that we're doing are having on our on our planet and we're having a there's a fire in North Carolina right now and you know it's December we just had mm-hmm. almost 80 degrees here in Florence <laughs> last week um we don't have any snow it hasn't snowed in Colorado Springs so we are seeing these changes mm-hmm. and it's it impacts our our crops it impacts our soil it impacts everything that goes into feeding us um and then we we see on the social side of things how 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 harmful it can be when we don't have properly fed populations. Mm -hmm. Or even we're seeing in grocery stores, just a lack of of veggies, lack of meat, lack of pretty much everything for various reasons. I think that was something that was really during a COVID, like we, we started saying, Oh, Hey, we may be producing these things in our area, but they are not coming back into the area. They're going out and then we're getting back from other areas. So I think that was a huge discovery for a lot of people of how, how much change needs to happen for that food supply and that supply chain. Yeah. And I don't want to, you know, call out too many big companies because (laughs) we're so small right now, (laughs) but that, that is a product of, of, um, of bigger companies being able to provide uh, prices that smaller, you know, distributors can't really compete with, mm-hmm. right? And so we, we, we have to change the fundamental, I guess, the fundamentals of our supply chain in order to make a difference there. Um, but our farmers, you know, they sometimes get paid twenty cents for a hundred pounds of potatoes, and. And then that goes because, you know, the bigger companies can give that to the grocers that has to go to, you know, wherever far away first before it goes back to our Mm -hmm. local grocer in Alamosa, even though that potato was grown right across the street. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there, there are big problems there and it increases the cost for our farmers. It increases the price that we have to pay as consumers. And then it's just not as fresh, you know, getting a tomato from Hannigan that when it was grown, you're picking it right off the plant. You're going to have better Mm -hmm. nutrients and vitamins for yourself to, to grow, um, rather than it sitting in storage for two or three months before it ever gets to your hamburger, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's say you can look into a magical ball and, and you can see what the future looks like and what the future of Barnell, what are some of the things that you're super excited about for the future of the company and just the future of this area of technology? So we are excited, um, I, about a lot of things because we're, we're, we're not stopping. We're not going to slow down. We're going to take over the world of ag doing what we're doing. Um, but we're excited to be able to hire people in, in rural America, I guess. And, um, you know, create these, these coding jobs and these drone pilot jobs and these robotic operator jobs that are, that pay a decent wage and keep the people who love living in places like Florence or La Junta, keep them there. Mm -hmm. Um, because we don't want them, that creativity, that innovation, we don't want it leaving. We don't want it in Denver. We want it right here next to us so that we can continue to build on the ideas that are going to take over the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's our our biggest, I guess, point of excitement. Um, and then the technology side of things, like the things we're going to be able to do, are are incredible. From the robotic side, us being able to polycrop on an acre and maximize the square foot of an acre rather than the acre. Um, our ability to collect information eventually we'll be able to have so much information and data that we'll be able to process it and help our farmers on the commodity market tell them when the best time to sell is when the best time to buy is for things like corn and soybeans and grains um and so that's treating you know how big wall street is we can turn the data that we're getting into as a big commodity wall street basically Mm -hmm. um and that's just going to continue to improve our profit margins for our farmers um and then we can help reconnect our urban and rural areas by telling the story of the farmer someday um you know we have all of this this data from things like our owl perch where we're watching the crop grow the the consumer can come to barn owl and say you know 
well, Hannigan grew this tomato. I picked it. I ate it. And this is where it was grown. This is what mm. was done to it. This is how, how much time and effort was spent by these farmers. Um, and having that, that full connection that of, of from the farmer, who is the real hero here, to the person who is eating it, um, you know, to, to have a wonderful family dinner or to, you know, to just be able to have, I guess, a real meal sometimes. Because mm-hmm. um, there's a number of reasons from being too busy to to cook a, a family meal to not having enough money to buy it. Um, so being able to tell that story is, is going to be we think life changing um, mm-hmm. for a lot of people, um, but mostly our farmers who are again the true heroes here. Definitely. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion, and thank you so much for for taking the time to to have this and and educating me on some of the things that are in the agriculture thing because it's it's fascinating to me to see this merging of technology and agriculture in this in this ever changing world and and climates that keep on shifting like you said we're in Colorado in December and it we just experienced our first 30 degree day yeah yeah well thanks for having me I'm, I'm you know here at emergent campus anytime you want to come come and hang out and talk robots or or corn or soybeans or anything else just mm-hmm. come on by and we're excited to be here in Florence and you know we're gonna take over the world of ag so stay tuned I guess oh yeah <laughs>